do you want to buy a house or a property in Mexico, but don't know how to do it, or you don't even know if it's possible? Well, it is, and you're about to find out how to do it. Welcome to the Real Estate Agent Success Tools interview series, where we interview successful agents and share their secrets with you. All right, we are live, and I'm excited to be here with my good friend. I know him as Jose, but his real name is Guadalupe. Uh, there is a story that I learned about that when we were down visiting in Mexico not long ago. That's a that's a separate conversation we're going to get into. But, uh, dude, I'm going to just call you Jose because that's how I know you. But, uh, dude, time. thanks for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me, Case. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, uh, we go back a ways, a ways, back from the the little bus on the way to yeah, school. Yeah, yeah, man. I'm, uh, we both rode the short bus to school, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, well, hey, man, you've got a pretty cool story um, on, you know, how you got to where we grew up and how we met to, you know, after school to serving in the military to where you're at now. So tell us your story, you know, give us a little bit of background on you. All right, Chase, I think uh, probably every realtor can relate to this. Uh, for the most part, you know, my experience has been that every realtor that I worked with didn't originally plan. It seems like to be a realtor, you know, I think it's for the adventurer and also for the person that, you know, wants to be at the front of a lot of things and involved with, uh, with responsibilities that are super important. So, um, you know, I find myself here in Mexico now doing real estate after, uh, I would say a wide variety of experience, having grown up in Washington State and uh, participated in the United States Marine Corps uh, for my four years of active duty. And then uh, following that up, I joined the U.S. Forest Service. So I got an opportunity to work with some great folks there out in, in the uh, wilderness and, and, in, uh, and doing various operations. Um, but I think we all get to a point in our lives where, you know, we've accomplished a lot of things and are looking for new challenges. And I think to me, having moved to Mexico and then looking uh, around, uh, you know, where I would better fit in in the types of uh, work in general, the one that was really screaming at me was real estate, uh, primarily probably because of its complexities, you know, I've always liked those complex challenges. And um, also having family members and then uh, friends encouraging me to, to look into this, having a lot of the necessary qualities to be successful in real estate. And here in Mexico, important things like structure and you know, being able to follow up and, and stuff like that. Cool. Yeah, and then... Um... Just so, I don't know if you're able to adjust it, but if it can, you're kind of hard to hear. If not, no worries. We'll just uh, we'll kind of work through it. But you know, a lot of people um, don't know how to purchase property in Mexico. There's a lot of misconceptions around it. You know, we are both um, you know from Washington State. You know, the higher you get in latitude, the crummier the winters get, and the more you want to get away and have a have a warm place to go from like I don't know October to March. So how does the process of purchasing property in Mexico actually work for someone who isn't, uh, who hasn't a resident or a resident yet? Yes. So, you know, we do have a lot of our clients that come into Mexico and come into the Puerto Vallarta port and then, uh, look into other areas like the Riviera Nayarit where I work at. And so, um, for somebody to, uh, that comes in as a tourist, you are able to go into the process of acquiring properties here in the federal zone. This is the area you're you're uh, looking at, you're having fun. So as a tourist, you can come in and start that process. And there are different tiers of acquiring the, the property if you already have a status, like a residency is facilitated uh, a bit in acquiring the property. And it also kind of helps you out in uh, accelerating your your status. So it's kind of similar to, I think, purchasing everywhere in general. There are contracts that are established. We do have a 10% down that's expected for a deposit, a safety deposit that goes to an escrow company. 
where it really gets to the nitty gritty is on the negotiations. You know, you'll see stuff that's that's priced according to the market that it's in. So uh, having a good negotiator uh, agent or agency really helps you to get that process started. And then the rest of the formalities are taken care of by attorneys who are coordinators that work with our authorizing uh, entity, which is a notario system here. And I know that, you know, hearing notary notario, you know, back home where I grew up in Washington, that could be just basically your, uh, your bank uh, agent notarizing something for you that gives a validity. Well, here in Mexico, the notary, the notary system is a highly vetted process. And the attorney that is in charge of the notary system, you know, it is not just any kind of random attorney. There's a process of selection for that. You have to be in elevated percentiles within your own core group of attorneys to be able to qualify for a notary. It's a very important position. And this is ultimately our ultimate checkpoint in the process of acquiring property here. Back home, I think we traditionally use like uh, um, titling companies and we have the ability to go and get uh, home insurance insurance right off the back in conjunction with your title company. So it gives you that added security. So here, what we do and how it works in Mexico, you know, all of that, what you have back home is integrated into a process that starts right with the agent. You know, the agent is vetting the documentation that comes in, is verifying some of the physical uh, parts of the property. And then, you know, that is uh, passed on to the attorney who is doing the vetting for the documentation so that what he turns over to the notary is completely uh, qualified. So when we talk about the internal purchasing, there is a structure for that. Um, but we all know that things can run into delays and, you know, uh, uh, that just happens with systems that are not as modernized, I would say, as something that we would experience in, in markets like Portland, Seattle, and other places like that. So then um, there are, so with systems not as modernized, and does that, is that like automated checks and balances, or does that extend the escrow period? What's a typical escrow period, um, or how long are you on your contract, usually, on a property? So that's, that can be very uh, variable and, you know, pre COVID, I think it was a more condensed time and you were looking at your traditional closing from signing the contract to the actual signing of the closing was uh, 45 days to, to 60 days. You know, now that we are on the other side of the pandemic here in Mexico from 2020 and we went into 2021 and now we're in 2022. Those time frames have been actually extended a little bit. You know, there are variables to federal agencies and state agencies in limiting uh, the amount of employees that they have in there to process uh, the, the purchases. And so here, every purchase does. You know, there are entities that go to the state, to the federal. There's the Department of Interior, Foreign Investment. So there's a variety of information gets dispersed, and then it comes back. And it comes back in different time frames, so that's what creates those time gaps in the closing. So it isn't just one place, you know, it, and it's not one place usually that gets bogged down. Uh, but that's what we see, you know, the 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 bogging down of some of these processes extend our closings to. Right now, we're looking at you know sixty to ninety days, you know, to to uh, notify our clients that that's what we're experiencing now. Okay. I mean, that's, that's fair. Everybody's market's different, right? So we're in a, just a really condensed time zone or time frames right now in our market. We're looking at, you know, anything more than a 30 day escrow period is long. Right. Um, so I do have a kind of question like misconceptions are people can't buy in Mexico unless they have somebody buy it with them. If they're buying on the ocean, you know, can you clarify that for me? You know, if like, if I came down and wanted to buy a property, on the ocean or just anywhere do i like what's that look like who needs help me with that yep so i guess if we do a little bit of history on it it'll help clarify that and you know Perfect. help me under understand why we do specific things for acquiring property on the coast and so this actually kind of goes back a little bit uh to the second world war uh previous to the second world war and uh 
there was a amount of investment that, that was coming in from uh, Japan into Mexico in, uh, uh, I would say, close enough where it was uncomfortable for the U.S., especially after they went into the Second World War. And so kind of a, a um, adjustment that was made in conjunction with Mexico for security purposes, there was a federal zone that was enacted in Mexico and that uh, prohibited foreigners from directly buying into that zone. So that was a, a way to uh, protect not only Mexico's coastline, but also to reinforce that buffer zone that the U.S. had. So because of that and the federal zone creation is what caused the need of a Mexican national back in the day to establish the acquisition. And then through contracts, you would be associated to the property construction and living on it and selling it into the future. But uh, I think people ran into problems there. And so there was a reform where the federal zone was restructured so that uh, foreign investment could happen, but that can only happen through a bank. So a Mexican bank will hold a trust with the property uh, title and then the acquisitioner basically becomes a beneficiary of that trust. So we kind of changed it from using the Mexican national to acquire uh, because these properties back in the day were all agricultural domain. So through time, we have urbanized these ag lands. And so when that happens, the transition of the ag land to public property has to happen. And so that's where we find ourselves with, uh, you don't necessarily need that Presta Nombre as it was used before. So um, I think ultimately here in the future, this federal zone will go away. And so then that kind of changes the dynamic. Uh, for now, we're still structured within that. So the misconception is I need somebody at a Mexican national. Well, no, uh, it depends really of what type of property you're gonna acquire. But generally most uh, people, first time buyers, you know, are buying properties that have been titled and do not require that uh, that Mexican national to assist you. Got it. So hypothetically, you sent me some listings today to look at for fun. If I saw one of those and liked it and wanted to buy it and put an offer down and got a contract accepted, it would be pretty simple. Just a 60 to 90 day close. Absolutely. That's that's what it would come down to. What I sent you was basically um, we work with an association here in, in this area with uh, Puerto Vallarta, Riviera, Nayarit, and Compostela. And so when we work in this association, we share the information from listings. So what I grabbed was basically probably like three agencies listings that they have in that zone that you were specifically looking for. And since I do pull them out of the association, um, I, I know that they have gone through a vetting system, not only through the agent, the agency, but then the association, the association attorneys uh, review the documentation to make sure. So what you're getting in that product that I sent you is basically a title property, current on its taxes, ready to sell. And there is, uh, this is where, you know, we introduce, you know, like 90% of our clients into the, the, the properties that are already within the association. So there, so am, am I hearing you say that not all listings that you see online in Mexico have gone through this vetting process? That's correct. So um, it doesn't mean that they are not acquirable. It means that there are processes between the end result, which is the fideicomiso because of the federal zone and the beginning of submitting an offer. So it just kind of, it does vary. Um, because these agricultural lands cannot be sold, they can only have their rights transferred. It becomes a very sensitive subject when you, when you, uh, um, when you publish that they can be transferred. So what what you would most likely find is if you go to a, a realtor's website that's within the association and AMPI, and you see a property but it's not on the other person's website or the other associates' websites, then you would know that that's a personal listing and therefore it hasn't gone through all of that vetting. Doesn't, it doesn't mean that it's not acquirable. It just means that it does not meet the criteria of the association. 
but it Ooh. does meet the criteria of acquisition. Fascinating. Sounds like you need to be on, uh, be working with someone who knows what they're doing and has been around the block a time or two, i.e. Guadalupe Valdivinos. <laughs> you know, Ed, uh, it took a lot of uh, soaking in information, you know, listening to attorneys, uh, listening to uh, agents that had uh, previous experience, especially here in Mexico. And uh, the group that I work with is very knowledgeable in that. And they're associated with very connected and knowledgeable attorneys who coordinate our sales at the notario. So um, having a, a, a structured system right there at that key point uh, is like 50% of the work. You know, the other work is done with the marketing and then the agents and the uh, negotiation. Got it. So then you mentioned something interesting before where it sounds like an earnest money is 10% down. That's the deposit that's, we'll call it normal in Mexico. Yes, normal, you know, uh, that's the expectation that we've created within the association for our clients who are listing with us, that we, uh, within the uh, listing agreement, we uh, agree that a 10% is the minimum that we will accept as a down payment. Now, yes, per the listing agreement, we can decide that maybe they will accept less in lieu of something else or that the uh, instead of a 10%, it's a 15% or a 20%, you know, this is competitive. So something as small as, you know, going up 5% on the down payment may outcompete somebody. Right. So then what's, what's financing like? Like if, if I wanted to buy something down there, can I, can I get it financed or what's, how's, tell me about that. So financing, um, it's not as easy as it would be back in the States to finance for a home. And so I think more importantly here, because there is no titling company, there, there's a delay in that process for financing because the property has to qualify for the bank. So it may qualify to sell, it may qualify to be on our association, but ultimately if the bank does not qualify it for its investment, uh, they, they won't finance it. Uh, for a foreigner to come and request financing here in Mexico, it's a little bit more complicated. There are a couple more loops to go through. And um, so my experience has been that most of the clients that have gone that route um, have decided not to ask for financing here in Mexico because either the timeline's too long or maybe they are not in agreement with some of the uh, additional charges that may be associated with a financing from a foreigner in Mexico. So um, I would say that it's a little bit complicated, but then I've also have experience where uh, a client of mine has gone through that financing through a bank and was credited, you know, pretty much the amount he needed. Um, of course, there were special circumstances to that. You know, he does own a property, uh, a business here in Mexico. so. You know, that is something that can also be initiated to assist you in acquiring properties because you've established, you know, the uh, a fiscal entity that you're responsible for here in Mexico. So that does help. So generally speaking, cash is the way to go when purchasing in Mexico. You can finance it, but it's arduous is what it sounds like to me. It is arduous, and I think uh, the, the the facilitated way is to doing that uh, the cash transaction. So if there's something that you can do back home to uh, boost up, you know, what your uh, your financial portfolio as you come into Mexico, then you kind of you have your budget that you know that you're guaranteed, and then you can do supplemental financing with the banks here in Mexico, and know that you're not you overcommitted with the amounts and the percentages or that you may be paying here. Because uh, I think automatically most people will qualify for like a fifty to $100,000 uh, uh, bank loan. And then, then from there, they will take a look at a couple other uh, things like any bank would be to see where you're at with all your uh, finances and stuff like that. Got it, got it. I'm gonna switch gear gears just a little bit. Um, when I saw you, gosh, it was what, probably just a month ago, we were down there yeah. and we were staying and. We were in Guayabitos, you, uh, you're, you're just a little south of there in Sayulita. And then we hung out and we went up to Chacala and um, you were saying how vastly different these markets are and expectations and how they operate. You know, 
um, shed a little light on that because, you know, it, it varies from neighbor, neighborhood to neighborhood here as well. But uh, you were saying some more interesting stuff that kind of caught me by surprise. So share that with everybody. Yeah. So <clears throat> the markets here are very variable. And um, if you look at the historical here in Puerto Vallarta and Nayarit, there was just maybe an increase in real estate if we go back 10 years. You know, you go back beyond that, there was not a whole lot of interest in any of this part of uh, Nayarit. So um, when we had a ginormous increase in interest, I would say from like 2010 to 14, uh, the area of like Sayulita and Punta Mita became super popular uh, with some of the big major resorts that went into Punta Mita and then Sayulita for hosting, you know, some uh, surfing events. There were some reality TV shows that happened in that area. So it brought the popularity of the area uh, back up and not only in Mexico, but I think in general around the world, people were able to see places that they didn't know about that were north of Puerto Vallarta. And so uh, pre-pandemic, I think the increase then moved into Bucerias and then out here towards Sayulita, San Pancho. And basically that was the catalyst of everything that we're experiencing now. Um, so when you look at the geographics of it, we have uh, everybody flying into Puerto Vallarta, which is in another state here in Jalisco, which we do work in, in the Puerto Vallarta chapter of the AMPI Association. But when you look at the numbers, the 75% of those flying into Puerto Vallarta are actually coming up to the Riviera Nayarit. And you know, you you did that exact same thing, flew in there and stayed in Guayabitos, checked out Chacala, you were over here and that's it. So it's, you know, 75% of that. So 75% comes up the coastline and is now finding new places that were not looked at before. And when we have foreign investment, you know, that obviously changes the dynamic of what people were traditionally seeing and not only the selling, you know, what we, what they were selling at, but what kind of money is coming in now to acquire what you have there. And so that creates variability because we don't have established uh, realtors that have been there for years. You know, you saw Chacala and how big that is, but there is actually no real estate office there. You know, all the agents are, you know, like myself, you know, 25, 30 miles away. And so that's why it kind of all depends on the investment that the community itself will generate to make it popular. And then therefore the, the real estate value kind of goes up and down. So you can go from one county to another. Uh, for example, here in, in Ayari, the Bahia de Banderas County comes from the river between Jalisco and Ayarit, and then it comes to another river, which is just north of a town called Lo de Marcos. So that's Bahia de Banderas. And then right across there, you have Compostela County. So Bahia de Banderas County and Compostela County are two different entities. You know, process to, to get everything done is different. Your tax rate is, is different. So that's kind of what you will see in the Rivera and Ayarit. Bahia de Banderas, property values are already elevated. So you invest into that, you have a, a property value that's higher than if you're investing in the Compostela County automatically, even though it's beachfront, beachfront in Compostela County versus beachfront and by other banderas, it could be twice as much. Hmm. So that's how that kind of works. And just from one county line to the other, uh, because of also infrastructure is a very important one for the investment. and the Northern coast has less infrastructure. So therefore the property values are a little bit decreased because of that, but that's all changing. So part of that change will be enacted, I think nationally through uh, uh, infrastructure growth. The one that's being looked at right now, I think that's going through its approval phases will be the airport at the state capital, which uh, if the extension happens as it's scheduled, then that will bring, you know, that 75% that goes into PV, hopefully redirect a great majority to come into the state and then travel to these coastline towns uh, through the Northern coast and then uh, 
you know, connect to Puerto Vallarta. So this northern coast, this area that we're talking about, Compostela and Riviera and Ayari, is probably the future of expansion and development and growth uh, here in the next 10 to 15 years. Got it, got it. And when we hung out, you had a listing in Chicala. Did that ever go under contract or is it still available? It, this, is, uh, this is still available. We're able to uh, uh, do showings, virtual showings. We can accept an offer. This is a new listing. Chacala is in a different market as we kind of spoke about. So when we look at that market where there have not occurred a ginormous amount of sales that are reportable that we can go back and look at the historical uh, because of the lack of AMPI members selling in that, in that space, it's hard to like uh, gauge the value. So what we really look at, you know, when we're up there, we're like, okay, proximity to the ocean, what kind of neighborhood? It's on a slope. Is it mixed use? Can I use this as commercial? You know, all of those things, all those little factors really give the property value its, its due justice. So even though it can be in a place that has less infrastructure, if it has that criteria to, to be used for more than just a residence, that, that gives it value also. Got it. And then just, you know, it'll help. I, I kind of remember, but I'll have you tell me, and then it'll give other people an idea of, you know, what, what's the investment to buy property in a, in a small coastal town in Mexico? What was the purchase price or the asking price for that property? So we're looking at this property in Chacala. It's, you know, uh, basically like a, a city block away from the beach. We listed it at 379 and US. And keep in mind that a lot of the real estate here, just like where everything else is, you know, it's all negotiable. It really comes down to what, what the uh, seller is willing to accept to, to take the deal. And so this property is right there at the mid tier of pricing because what you look at the Chacala, you know, having that where it's at at 379 and you move it into the county that we just talked about, just into the county. And then that price just goes up like another 150 to 200,000. Crazy. You move that to San Pancho, Sayulita, and that same property now is, you know, half a million uh, here in San Pancho. That's definitely a half a million and up property. Fascinating. Just a few miles away or just across an arbitrary line, the, the value just skyrockets, increases like 50%. So, well, cool, man. Hey, if someone wanted to talk to you about buying in Mexico, whether the listing you have now or just any other place, you know, around Puerto Vallarta or north, um, how would they get a hold of you? Well, uh, one way to get a hold of us and then also accomplish a lot of the research is to go to our website at mexhome.com. And uh, Mexhome's webpage is very uh, user friendly, and you can use it as a search engine. You can punch in uh, AMPI listing just by the number, the name of the property, the general area, and it'll pull up information for you. I use it a lot to send out quick, um, uh, a list of quick properties. So you can go to mexhome.com and or contact me direct at Guadalupe at mexhome.com. Cool. And All or right. you can contact me at my cell number, country code, and through WhatsApp at 52-322-236-2887. And that's how you and I have talked on the phone. We've done, you know, face-to-face, -face, like FaceTime calls, uh, and it works great. So, well, hey, yeah. man, thanks for thanks for spending uh, a good amount of time explaining how the whole process works in Mexico um, I would love to be down there here again soon. You know, I'm here in Portland. So if anybody's looking to buy or sell in Portland, Oregon, or Vancouver, Washington, uh, Washington, you can reach out to me at, uh, you can sell 509-393-9123, or you can email me at chase at mrhousehack.com. Well, all right, everybody. Thanks for hanging out again. If you're looking to buy in Mexico, be sure to contact Guadalupe and we'll see you on the next one. All right. Bye. Thanks for watching the interview all the way to the end. If you liked it, please comment down below and like the video. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you can stay up to date on everything that we put out. If you want to see more interviews just like this one, check out this playlist right here, or you can let YouTube help you out and watch this video right here.